Okay, I think we're going to get started. There's still some people filing in, but uh, let our team keep letting them in as we get going. Uh, my name is Callie Anderson. I am the Director of Audio Journalism at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. And I am very excited to get going today. I believe, Jennifer, do you have a couple, any Zoom things you want to tell everyone before I launch into introducing our panelists? Yes, hi everyone. I have a welcome to the meeting. Thank you all for coming. I have you all on mute now. And if you see me click mute on you during the meeting, it just means that I've um, silenced your microphone. The chat box is in the corner for questions at the end. And you can view speaker view or gallery view, whatever you feel most comfortable in. We'll be recording soon now. Take it away, Callie. Thank you all. Okay, thanks, Jen. So yeah, just again, please keep on mute. We're quite a large group, which is great. Uh, but at the end, we'll be taking questions. But for those questions, we'll be asking you again just to put them into the chat. And we have two wonderful CUNY graduate journalism students, uh, Syed and Audrey, um, who will be uh, looking through those and pulling them out and trying to get as many questions as possible to our, our panelists. So yeah. Okay, so just in case you're not in the right Zoom room or you forgot what you signed up for today, we're gonna to be talking about how to fact check narrative audio journalism. Uh, there are, um, yeah, there's a lot to say about this, but uh, we, we have one hour. So what I'm going to do is start with uh, sort of some questions that I'm gonna to pose to our two panelists and uh, then you will have time at the end uh, to get in as much as we can. And I'd like to introduce our panelists. So first, uh, Natalie Mead. Natalie, do you wanna just say hello before I? <laughs> yes, hi everybody, nice to see you. <laughs> That's great. Uh, okay, so Natalie is a fact checker at The New Yorker where she works on the print magazine, the website, and occasionally also on The New Yorker Radio Hour. Uh, in 2017, she worked with Ronan Farrow on his feature about Harvey Weinstein's uh, use of non-disclosure agreements, which of course, is one of three pieces that earned the New Yorker a Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. Uh, Natalie has also moonlighted for ESPN's 30 for 30 podcast series called The Sterling Affairs, which we're going to talk about later today. And she most recently fact-checked Marvel's Declassified Documentary Podcast, which airs on Sirius XM. Uh, she's also a freelance journalist who, in her own reporting and writing, covers Caribbean affairs, mental health, and culture. And we have Christopher... Swatala, Christopher, would you like to say hello? Hi, thanks for doing this. I'm really excited to be here and have a chance to talk about fact checking. So am I. I started off as a fact checker, so this is like my dream. Finally, everyone cares about us. Fact checking is suddenly hot, apparently. I'm so excited. <laughs> anyway, Christopher Swatala is the head of fact checking at This American Life. Uh, he's worked there since 2015, and he first started fact checking in 2003 as an intern at The Nation, um, then he's freelanced for a number of publications, including GQ, the op-ed desk of the New York Times. And he's also written about fact-checking for Transom and for Slate. So welcome to both of you. Uh, okay, so I think I'd just like to start with just sort of getting everyone on the same page. I know there might be some people in here for whom fact-checking, especially for narrative long-form audio, is a bit of a newer idea, or maybe it's something they haven't had a ton of experience doing themselves. So let's just start with, uh, to either of you, uh, why is it important to, to fact-check narrative long-form audio stories? Sure, I can start off quickly. Um, I would say it's important because you know, humans are not infallible. I think that, you know, when we're talking and having conversations um, and we're, we're reporting on events that had happened, it is, we typically have different interpretations or memories of events. So it's important to go back and double check, especially when doing interviews, since a lot of narrative uh, long form podcasts involve interviews. And it's important to be able to go back and check what people say to make sure that their memory of the facts of the day are, are really important and accurate. Anything to add to that, Christopher? I mean, I agree with I agree with that. And one thing I will say about um, this American life in particular is like it's a really a it's a it's like a creative process and it's communal and like it's really kind of fascinating to watch because it'll be like eight, nine, ten producers like in a in a in a room like going over in a Google Doc like writing something and like they'll be so like in doing that they can be like 
oh, what, well, what's true to the reporter? And then like it can kind of shape the story and the reporter might be kind of like nervous or whatever. And like things get created in a way where they need somebody to come through and sort of like check like the narrative that they've that they've kind of like created and come with come up with in the room because it's, it's very much like a, a collective process and it's like oh wouldn't it be great if it was like this or wouldn't it be great if it was like this or what if it like happened like this and like in 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 in, in that creative process like um things slip in and you need somebody to kind of come through and be like whoa whoa whoa, whoa maybe we need to rein this in or pull this back a little bit um, so that's one thing and there's always the big fear that you know um and then it, it does happen that people kind of like fabricate stuff or um or, or misrepresent um a narrative which right. has happened the worst the worst case scenario yeah this um, is the worst case scenario <laughs> yeah um, I, I think that it's interesting that you say for audio, it's that collaborative process that makes it almost like we can probably, we'll talk about this a few times, but it makes it especially susceptible to things getting a little bit slippery because it's usually a really long timeline that you're working on something. And it's usually by nature, like tons of cooks in the kitchen, right? This is like what happens. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if you can at first in general terms, I'll, um, I'll go back to you, Natalie, talk about when you're brought into a process, what types of things are you looking for that are like the go-to, these are the kinds of things that always have to be checked. You mentioned interviews, but I know that it's more than just that. I know that you're also checking other things as well. So when you're given something, maybe first tell me what state are you usually given it in and what do you start looking for when, when you're starting that process? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. So usually as a, as a freelancer, um, I'm brought in towards the end of the process, right? So I see a script uh, in its near final stages. Um, usually after my work is done, it's then re-recorded and then for, for publication or for release, right? But when I receive a script, you know, I listen to the audio first and then I'm listening for everything that's a fact. It could be as simple as, you know, what the color of someone's uh, costume was for a Marvel uh, character or superhero, or it could be something that's like legally, uh, legally complicated or could implicate somebody, such as um, for 30 for 30, uh, there was an implication that in the forum club at the Staples Center that there was a lot of cocaine happening, right? People are doing a lot of drugs. And so I would flag that saying this could be a potential legal issue. Are we sure that this is okay and make sure you, your legal team looks at it. So anything that could sort of implicate somebody else, um, I look at things like if I could see, this is kind of like, it is very granular, but if I'm, if someone is just has described someone's property, I'll look at the Google Maps view of it to make, to see that their interpretation of what happened at this scene is actually correct based on this Google Maps. And you know, Google Maps isn't perfect, it's backdated perhaps from a couple of months or years ago, but it's really important to pay attention to all of the details. Um, and so that's, that's really like the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. It's just everything that's a fact. And there's things that are facts that you wouldn't think are facts, like perhaps the weather, or perhaps I mentioned a costume, or even like the details of who might have penciled or uh, a comic book, for example, to talk about Marvel. It's just very, everything that's detailed. And then I do sort of, I let, during the interview process, like I mentioned earlier, I fact check all of the facts that somebody says to make sure that they, that they match up with uh, the history uh, as it happened. Yeah, I think like for people, I, I started out way at the beginning of my career as a magazine fact checker as well. And I think, it is surprising sometimes for people who've never done the job or worked really closely with a fact checker to realize that like we really do mean every factual statement, yeah. like, all of them. I remember once I had to call someone and like really drill him on like the color of the door at his summer home as a child in France or something, you know, like these things that, you know, if fact is a fact and actually it wasn't, it wasn't pink, it was like bright red or whatever it is, right? So I think that that's an interesting um, sort of grounding that like, that's the level of detail that we go into. Christopher, um, what stage do you usually come into when you're working at This American Life? What do you get in front of you when in, it's your turn to work on a story? Yeah, so the way the process works generally would be like, so uh, a reporter and a producer shape 
a narrative and they get it into a draft that they feel good about. And then they take it to like, they start to do like group edits and then they'll go, they'll go through a couple of group edits. And by the time it gets out of a group edit with somebody who's like considered a more senior like producer or whatever, that's when I'll start like working on a script. And it's very much like Natalie said, it's like you really are, you're checking everything. You're checking minor details. You're checking the narrative. You're checking what it is that people said. You're checking that what people said like in the tape is actually true. Like they didn't say something wrong. Um, you're in what's kind of, especially on some of our bigger stories, what's kind of fascinating is like how much reporting really goes into them. Like so there are so many documents that some of my colleagues like find up legal documents, like whatever they are. And none of that stuff makes it into the story, but I, I still have to read all that stuff and I still have to be able to like, I don't want to, I don't know what the right word is, but like you, you have to immerse yourself in it and you have to understand that stuff before you start calling people. Because if you start calling people and you don't understand the material and like whatever it is, like the legal implications or the policy implications and all that stuff, you're not going to ask the right questions to get the answers that you need to check the narrative, to check the, to check the story. So you really do have to like, I usually feel like a big story will spend three, four or five days kind of like, just like delving through documents. And then like the next week will be like, I'll just be on the phone, like nonstop. Yeah, I would agree with what Christopher just said. I, the research folder that I, when I get it is such a treasure trove of information that really is the foundational material to the entire episode or series of the podcast. So understanding that that fundamental information is really key for a smooth checking process, but it also sort of helps you go back and helps you give a, it helps you have a sort of a framework and sort of basically understanding of what this, the narrative is going to be about. And if you have a question about something in the text or in the script in particular, you know, you can go back to the original document that you've seen. So I would say if you ever work with checkers or you wanna check yourself, I would really just, organization is key and having all of that fundamental information uh, set aside and in a folder on your drive is, is essential. Yes, for sure. And I mean, I think if you're, as you, you're also a freelancer, I'm sure you're like every fact checker's dream, giving the most complete research folders when you have to send stuff to a checker. Um, okay, I want to get into some of the details because this is a challenging thing to talk about in the abstract. And so I think what we're gonna do here today is just get right into it. So we're really lucky because both Christopher and Natalie have shared with me some examples of specific episodes that they worked on and in some cases examples of the kind of documentation they used. And so I think the best way to do this is just to get into it. So uh, Christopher, I think I'm going to start with you um, in terms of how this all actually goes down. Uh, we're going to start with this American Life story called A Phone Flickers in the Dark. And I want to play um, a clip from that, a little excerpt from that episode. Um, it starts with a man sort of obsessively watching TikTok videos in the clip. But as I'm uh, to do that, I'm going to share my screen for a second. And while I'm getting that queued up, maybe you could just give us a bit of context about this episode and, and what we're about to hear. So we're not dropping yes. people in. So the basic gist of the story is about a man. He's a Uyghur man and he's living in um, Istanbul. And he moved there in like 2014 or so with his wife and started a young family. And over the course, over the course of like living there, you know, the, the, the mother wanted to take her children home to see their grandparents. And so they, so they did and they, they disappeared. Most likely they wound up in re-education schools or, um, or uh, re-education camps, the parents. So they, they've disappeared. And this, and this is the scene where the father is watching TikTok and he, and he thinks he sees his, his son in, in a re-education camp. Okay, great. I'm gonna play a little bit of it now. On January 4th, 2019, he was in bed and, like usual, scrolling through TikTok. It's around 2 a.m. And Abdurrahman sees this video. It's a little boy with big cheeks, expressive eyes. He's in a school, answering questions in Mandarin Chinese from a teacher, off camera. Behind him, kids are milling about in winter coats. They have a leather uh, jacket. Winter jacket. The teacher asks the kid a bunch of questions. 
What's the name of the fatherland? The People's Republic of China. What's on the fatherland's flag? Five stars on a red flag. Where's your water bottle? Water bottle is here. Where do we put the food we can't finish? In the trash. Abdurrahman doesn't speak Mandarin, but there is one word that stands out to him. Abdulaziz. What's your name, the teacher asks. I'm called Abdulaziz, he says. How old are you? I'm four. That's how old Abdurrahman's son should be now. The video is just 15 seconds long, one of a hundred that he's watched that day. And he can't be sure it's his son Abdulaziz. But Abdurrahman simultaneously gets this rush of love, believing that it's his son, and this intense fear that it's really him. Because his kids are supposed to be living with their grandparents while he figures out a way to get them home. And it looks like they aren't. So now we're just going to jump. Hopefully everyone can see this, uh, you know, shot of a Google Doc that you've shared with me. Um, so this is some of the script that you were working with. And the first thing I just want to highlight is that you were working using footnotes. And for every page, there are quite a few. Um, and I guess you want to just talk a little bit about what went into checking this section. If everyone can now see on my screen, there's a number of notes about interviews you did, uh, primary and secondary sources you looked at. So maybe just give us a little bit of a sense of how this went down and what you were looking for. Well, I mean, I talked to Abdul Rahman about it all. And, but then also like we ran the videos by several different Mandarin speakers um, and a Uyghur speaker to get make sure that Abdul Louise could be heard properly. Um, I looked, yeah, I watched the, the videos. And I think the thing, like what was kind of interesting about this scene was that in the first draft, it was kind of written in a way where it was sort of like very definitive, where it was like, that's my son. And then like, you know, talking to him and, and thinking about like how you could know such a thing, we kind of reined that back a little bit because we couldn't be like 100% sure because we had no way to track down the son. We, you know, he thinks it's his son. He hasn't seen him in like two, two three years. And so we just, we just weren't, we just weren't 100% sure. And that was like the kind, that was kind of the interesting trick about this story as a whole was just that there was a lot of like these TikTok videos that Abu Rahman, you know, told us about and talked about on tape, but he had like lost his phone. And so we couldn't see them. And so we didn't use those, though there was one where, that we did use where his friend showed a video of his neighborhood or his house being destroyed. And that's because we were able to get a police officer in uh, Aksu near where he lived to say like, oh no, that place is, your, your house is gone. Um, so we, like we, the reporter was able to confirm that. So we, so we used that even though we didn't have the video. But then there are other videos where there's like a, a, a Chinese uh, man dancing with a Uyghur woman, like she's Muslim, like they're dancing in the home. And like, it's really, um, powerful video but we had those TikTok videos and so we so we felt comfortable using them using them and so that was kind of like the trick of the whole piece was kind of going through and being like wait this is what we know this is what we don't know this is what we feel comfortable saying is like mm, maybe we maybe we should hedge this because like uh Xinjiang is just like a part of China you can't call without putting people at at risk and so it was just it was just a tricky thing to navigate um but anyway like that that moment where he's like I can't be, you know, he can't be sure that it's his son. That was kind of like grew out of the fact checking. And that was kind of indicative of like what it was like, basically fact check that whole story. Um, I find like that's an interesting moment because, you know, I've been on both sides of this as a fact checker and as the reporter or the producer who wants to keep a narrative turn in the piece that's really important. And so I wonder if we can like hear a little bit about what it's like to have for you to have to say to the reporter and the producers working like yeah it's a great moment to have him have this huge revelation that's like that's my son i saw him <laughs> on tiktok but what is it like to have to be sort of like the downer and like do you get pushback like tell us what that's like for you to have to be the one to say like i don't know if we can for sure say it's his son you know like actually the the her, the reporter, she comes out of like a strong like public radio tradition, and so did the producer, and they were both just so lovely. Like there, there, there wasn't any like pushback at all. They were just like, no, no, like we really want to think through 
we really want to think through all this stuff and be sure that it was be sure that it's like we're being as careful as we can be um and so there wasn't a lot of like it was more like we were like in this thing together like you know this like this story we were working on we spent about two weeks working on it like kind of like in the peak of the lockdown in new york city and we were just like in you know in the reporters in istanbul and you know we're here we're, we were we worked really well together it actually it was really nice and um i don't know like just in general like this american life is really um open and takes fact checking i think like seriously um and it's like it's not it's there's not like i mean i have workplaces where it's more like i don't know bro like not really killing the story you know like it doesn't matter does it like i mean i've definitely dealt with people who are like that but that's not my experience um here right that's helpful. Um, before we move on to uh, an example from Natalie, I just want to scroll down because we are not going to play the other clip, but you sent me another excerpt from later in that piece. And this is sort of when you're going through, like in the actual story, the attempts, you know, to accountability and to contact people and sort of showing some of the reporting in the script. Um, and I noticed there's a ton of footnotes and there's just like, unresolved comments from you and the producers so i don't know if that was just a mistake or it was there like a reason you might leave something unresolved or is that does that tell us something <laughs> well they're, they're unresolved because like these questions got resolved i mean got raised at like i don't know we broadcast at like seven o'clock i think or eight I don't know, eight o'clock in New York it's seven o'clock in Chicago eight o'clock in New York and these questions were being raised at like 4 30 5 o'clock on friday friday night and it was basically like somebody was kind of kind of just basically asking another producer was like asking like me and emmanuel like wait, wait do we really need to have this stuff about perita and like all this stuff like that we like is this necessary it's kind of like slowing down like let's just get to the more emotional stuff of, i don't it's been a long time but like and basically emmanuel just pinged me and was like hey christopher don't we need this and I was like, so I called her and I was like, hey, I think we need it for this, this, and this reason. And I think, you know, she ended up having a conversation with the other producer and Ira and they all decided like, oh yeah, it's like good thing to have. We were just like trying to be like as upfront about like the fact that, you know, we were able to confirm that, you know, Parita and Abdul Rahman were married and they like lived in this area. I actually ended up speaking to one of Parita's cousins who knew them in uh Aksu and he was like at one point and he was sort of just like oh yeah I know them they were married and her family was uh religious and he didn't know and he's like I haven't seen them in a long time I don't know what happened to him and so like but anyway like that that's like us just trying to be like upfront about like this is what we know and basically me and Emmanuel who was the producer and the reporter kind of thought it was important for us to be kind of like pretty clear about what we were able to like nail down definitively. Yeah, I mean, yeah. as you said earlier, so much of it is like invisible, the work that goes behind all these lines, but it's sort of especially interesting when it's so important that it actually has to make it into the lines, the, the verification and what you did. Um, I want to move uh, to, <laughs> just wanna ask you what this is. You sent me this <laughs> before I moved to Natalie. <laughs> this was one of your documents for that piece. So what is this? Because I, I don't, I'm not that able to read it. You know. So like, <laughs> so the basically like, so um, I, I think Dury, she's the reporter. She did a pretty good job fact check or uh, footnoting like different things. And there was a moment in the script where it's like, I contacted this agency, I contacted this agency, I contacted this agency, like this ministry of prisons or whatever, all in China. And like her footnotes were just like page after page after page of this. And I was like, I don't know what this is. And so I, I, I sent some of those images to a friend of mine who speaks Mandarin. And he's like, oh, this is the Ministry of Information or whatever. And uh, that's that's their contact information. And I was like, does that have a phone number or whatever? And he's like, no, 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 it's a fax number. And so I was like, oh, okay, so she faxed this stuff. And I was like, well, what's the responses and what did she fax? And so then I called her, she had a fixer in, um, in Istanbul, somebody who speak, spoke Uyghur and Mandarin because she doesn't speak either. And so I called this guy and he was like, oh yeah, we tried to fax them, but the faxes didn't go through. And I was like, what do you mean the faxes didn't go through? And he was like, well, they just didn't work. And I was like, ah, and this was like a week before broadcast. And so 
you know, me and Manuel and Dury had a conversation and we ended up, and like Dury had this theory that she didn't think that the faxes went through because they were from another country um, and they wouldn't go through in China. So we ended up hiring a, a journalist in Beijing to fax all this stuff to these different agencies over the weekend. And there's like a scene in the story where this journalist, she calls one of them and the guy's like, answers the phone. He's like, yeah, the fax doesn't work. And she's like, was there another fax? And he's like, no, but I'll listen to your questions. And then she starts asking questions about how the family disappeared and their re-education uh, camps. And he's like, you're a liar. Like this, that's not true, not, and blah, blah, blah. And so, so anyway, that all became part of the story. That's cool. I like when the, the fact checking you know, <laughs> process also winds its way back in. Um, okay, I want to uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I want to move on to Natalie's uh, great example that you shared. Um, so this is from the 30 for 30 series, The Sterling Affairs, um, which for those who haven't listened, it's about the um, now very disgraced uh, former owner of the Los Angeles Clippers, Donald Sterling, and these tapes that were recorded of him being racist and otherwise insulting and offensive in a myriad ways. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm going to play the part of, of sort of the reporter and then a little bit of Magic Johnson reacting to Sterling sort of being recorded, insulting him specifically. Is there anything you want to say about this, Natalie, before I, I play the audio? Sure, yeah. So this, um, we'll talk more about the audio itself, but um, this is a really interesting series to check her, uh, overall because it talks, you know, uh, Cal, you mentioned it just all about Donald Sterling and not just this tape that we're about to hear now, a clip of it, but also um, his history um, as, a, as a landlord in LA and being this really terrible um, owner of a basketball team who wanted to reuse medical tape to save money. It's really odd examples throughout the series, but um, the foundation of the series um, is this clip of the audio we're about to hear right now, and I can't wait to talk about it. It was as shocking and as bizarre as anything on the tape that a picture of V. Stiviano and Magic Johnson had set him off. To hear Donald Sterling talk that way about Magic? The guy who turned the Lakers into a dynasty? Who'd fought off HIV? That's the guy Donald Sterling told his mistress wasn't welcome at his games? Plain and simple, when you heard those comments, Magic, what was your reaction? That was really upset, you know. Um... You can't understand how hurt I was. He shouldn't own a team anymore, especially when you have African Americans renting his apartments. Okay, so actually that's just a short part of the longer section, but I found it interesting because you told me that there's something in there that in the original script you did end up having to change, just in that short reference to Magic Johnson, that was a pretty big one. Yes, so um, in the original script, um, the reporter, her name is Ramona Shelbourne, and she is an expert reporter, especially about basketball um, in LA. Um, so having a reporter, as in, this is inside, having a reporter who's already an expert is, uh, is really like a treat as a fact checker, but also sometimes they make very subtle mistakes like this one. So in the first pass of the script, she said that Magic Johnson had AIDS, but in reality, he had HIV, and it, which is the virus, while well, AIDS is a condition. So it's a very small nuance, but at the end of the day, it's a very big inaccuracy in terms of Magic's, you know, his, his, his virus, his disease that he was able to overcome over time. And especially, you know, in the early 90s when he contracted the disease and how it really affected the Black community, it was really important to get this fact right and to correct it. And fortunately, you know, the team at ESPN was also great and receiving changes and they changed it over uh, very quickly without, without debate, so. Um, I want to stop sharing my screen in a second, but I just want to show one more thing that you sent me, which I thought was interesting, like the range of sort of documents you, you, you use to fact check. So on one side, we've got like a little screenshot of just the court documents, which I'm sure I'll get you to talk about in a minute, of like how much you often use court documents for this kind of thing. Um, and then you also mentioned that you actually used TMZ. Um, what was the actual fact that TMZ confirmed for you? Sure. So um, you'll, when you listen to the series in episode one, I believe, um, or I think it's episode two, the original script described like a video going viral of this audio that 
was the audio Donald Sterling saying these really like heinous racist things. But in reality, it's not a video. It was simply like an audio clip. And so in my notes to uh, the, the editorial producer, um, Julia, Henders uh, Julia Henderson, yeah, um, basically, um, I had to say, listen, if you if we keep the word video in, it might make listeners think that they missed something. So the thing is that V. Stiviano took to recording nearly every conversation she ever had with Donald Sterling. So, so as to help him remember things because she said that he couldn't remember things that he said to her. So this is this, you know, terrible clip is just one of the things that she captured on her in their day-to-day -day correspondence. So it was really important to make sure that we didn't misrepresent the actual like key to this entire series, which was this audio wow. report. So we came to a compromise and the audio it. went viral um, over time rather than saying this video went viral. And so, and TMZ was the first news source to actually break the news about, uh, about uh, Donald Sterling. Whereas it had sort of been kicked around the LA Clippers office and the NBA like upper management as well, but the TMZ was the ones to break the story. And usually in fact checking, you always want to find like the primary source. And often and you want to go back to the news organization that had the original bit of information. And that's why TMZ was crucial in this specific instance. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting to, yeah, like whatever was first, they were first. <laughs> yeah, and ironically, I don't know if anybody knows this, TNZ is usually very accurate um, in terms of their celebrity gossip. Um, so when, when, you, when it comes down to it, they're, they're quite a reliable source, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I know people have questions. I can see them coming in. Uh, I guess the last thing I want to ask before I start just letting other people ask questions, because I could go on uh, about a lot of these things. Um, I'm sure there's some people listening and watching that are maybe feeling a little overwhelmed or worried that they have not done things correctly if they're at a shop that doesn't have a fact checker or they haven't worked with one before or they're a freelancer who's just like not sure if they're giving the right stuff to a fact checker or you know they're a small audio department at a giant media brand that doesn't pay as much attention to audio as they should. So what advice do both of you have um, for someone who's independent or for a smaller shop, doesn't have a full-time fact checker to bring the same kind of rigor that you bring when you're working as an outsider onto their own work? That's my question for either of you. I'll take a stab. Um, I think like one of the things I'm a big, I've become a big believer in like, like the footnoting process. So I think like, even if you're like, you're doing, doing that process, like if you're working independently, you can, you can do that yourself, like go through and start footnoting your sourcing. But um, there's a, there's a few tricks that I think too, like, I think I'm a big believer in that. So that way you can kind of like see where things are coming from. But the other thing that I'm, a, I, I really believe like what can be really helpful if you're working like by yourself is like, let's say you wrote, you write in times new Roman and like, and then you, on your like, when you start the fact checking process, change it to like Arial or something, and it, you'll, it'll force you to like see things that you you won't have thought. Like you'll see, you'll just see the script in a different way because it's in a different print, and it'll just it just changes your brain. And the um, other thing is, like instead of like as you're going through your script and you're making footnotes and you're kind of like doing your final read, don't be like, oh, I know this is true because you know I saw it there, or I know this is true because I saw it there. Just kind of as you read, just kind of ask yourself, like, wait, what is wrong? What is, what is still wrong? What is still wrong? Like, that's the question in the back of your mind as you're kind of like doing a final read on something, because there's always something that's not quite right. And um, if you're kind of just going through and telling yourself this is true because of this, and you're not going to, you're not going to see things. You want to be really hard on yourself and ask yourself, like, what is still wrong? Great advice. Natalie? Yeah, I think a lot of that is great. I had no idea about the font changing tip. I'm going to use that, Christopher. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Uh, but yeah, when you go back through and after you've written a script, I think footnoting is really important because as you go back and look at your original source, you oftentimes can catch your own errors. And one thing I would add is that try to like bake in an extra half of a day just to, so you can dedicate a good chunk of time just to rereading the script and sort of 
removing yourself from the process. So it might mean like putting it down for a day, sleeping on it, waking up in the morning and just giving your, your brain a rest. So then you can sort of look at it and it's sort of a uh, 30,000 foot view, but also at the same time, like looking at the details, um, sort of because it's sort of removing yourself from the process, which I think will help you be able to look at your script uh, objectively and still be able to sort of criticize it because in some ways, fact checking is a bit of a critical analysis of, of the words on the paper or the audio that you're hearing. So I think just giving yourself the time and space to do that and like planning ahead, like I'm gonna need to dedicate six hours. Like I typically dedicate, it typically takes me like 10 hours to fact check like one and one hour episode. Um, and you, know, you, you might not have 10 hours if you're a one person team, but it, it's really crucial to like footnote while you're writing the script and then at the end like give yourself another time to, more time to double check it which might help split up the time and be able to make sure that your script is accurate um, before you track it yeah great great advice um okay i'm giving uh syed i'm going to come to you after this question so if you want to pull out the first one from the chat um i guess the last thing would just be um since you've both done magazine fact checking and audio fact checking, I'm just curious uh, what if there's any differences to how you work or if there's differences to the process other than potentially the slightly more collaborative nature than maybe magazine articles have a slightly smaller team sometimes. But anything else about the actual process of fact checking that you found different between the two or is it pretty much the same workflow on both sides? That's a good question. I, I would say that fortunately, um, when I come into it as it comes to checking as a freelancer for audio, most times I don't actually have so far, <laughs> I haven't had to call a lot of sources. And so I've been able to rely on the interviews, but, but I'm still like held to the standard of fact checking what people say. Um, so that's really important. Uh, in a very recent episode of Declassified, um, that I actually had an interview with, uh, uh, George R. 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 Martin, um, don't quote me on that. I, so basically, he basically said something to the effect of where like the second annual Marvel convention, Comic Con was held. And he actually got the name of the, uh, the um, excuse me, the, the vicinity, the, the, the vicinity where they held it incorrect. And so I had to go back and write in the script saying, this is actually what it is called. Uh, and the producer was like, well, this might slow down the narrative. Well, I say, well, maybe it's a place for where we can add like a parenthetical that we would add perhaps in a print piece. So I tried to use a print tactic to correct George R. R. Martin um, in a way that would have been quick, but still would have, would have given George R. R. Martin the agency that he did have as an expert, as somebody who was there at the time in 1976, I believe, um, while also sort of continuing the narrative quickly, but in print checking, a parenthetical is often used to sort of break the narrative, pause quickly. Uh, either it's, oftentimes it's used to sort of either say that someone didn't participate in the checking process or it's used to sort of give a counter argument or to correct something that someone has said. So that was my sort of goal in that moment was to sort of use a print tactic in an audio script. And I hope it works out. I hope that's, that's how they edit it. So, so it hasn't, that one hasn't aired yet? I don't think so. I think it's coming out very, very soon. If it happens okay. There. So you'll have to, and so you'll have to see if your suggestion of how to handle it actually is what makes it through. Yeah. yeah. Oftentimes, like, I'll, it's actually a actually collaborative process. So sometimes, like, one of the producers on the episode will respond to me in my comments, and that was the dialogue we had, like, in the comments. So I believe it should be in the script, and they should have updated it. And either Evan or Lorraine, who are the hosts, will make that note. Um, but the reason I sort of pushed back on that was because what George R. R. Martin said wasn't accurate. And so like as a fact checker, I can't let things go that aren't accurate because that'll keep me up at night. Um, so I think that they'll, I mean, the team at Marvel is great. And so they'll come up with a creative solution to get that in there. Um, I'm very positive of it. But um, I would say yeah, I was very collaborative with the process. And I would just say like in, on the magazine side, it's also very collaborative, like the writer and the editor, at least at a place like the New Yorker where the facts are like supreme. Um, and sometimes, you know, the narrative will have to change because of the facts, you know, prove uh, otherwise, or there's more facts to be uncovered that make the story even better than it is on paper. Um, so yeah, so those are the main differences I've seen in the process. Anything to add to that, Christopher? I, I don't, I mean, I think like the way, no, I mean, no, I think the way the, the audio, like the way we fact check is pretty much like the ma a magazine would do it. Like you call everybody, 
you know, you, you, you look at, do- it's kind of the same. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that idea though, of like the limitations of what you can add being a bit different in audio, right? Like you can't just have like a whole yeah. paragraph voiced by the host as a parenthetical as easily as you can for, for, for print. No, I haven't thought of that before. That stuff we like, you, you kind of just, you cut it and work, mm. work around it and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, no, there's, I don't have, I mean, I think the, I think the way, you know, we fact check is like a magazine would fact check. Nice. Okay. I want to get to some questions, uh, from our eager, uh, big audience here. So Syed, can you, uh, give us one to start with, please? Sure. So the first question I have is do fact checkers account for omitted facts and what is the judgment process for determining whether some omitted piece of information must appear in the story? Something that was omitted. Okay, uh, who wants to take that one? Um, I can... Go ahead, Christopher. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of like an omitted, like, I mean, I could think of like an omitted, it depends on like, I guess what the omitted piece of information is. I can think of like things like where that makes sense to add stuff like for legal reasons. Um, like I, I was uh, I was working on a story recently where some guy was um, there was a domestic abuse call and like he was a doctor and they found a bunch of drugs and like a lot of drugs like to the extent where they charged him with selling drugs and he had guns and all this stuff and he had threatened his girlfriend with you know her life she did a restraining order or whatever and he was an ER doctor and they. Uh, they uh but anyway he 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 got those charges all dismissed so they weren't like they weren't actual he had no criminal history for all intents and purposes so we 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 added a little bit of language about how like you know the fuller story because you would otherwise be leaving the impression that the guy had two felonies when he didn't um that's one I don't know if that gets at what you're asking. Yeah, I mean, that's a good example of not having that little piece of information in there lets it stay quite misleading, right? That he yeah. was not actually, um, you know, he was acquitted. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to take another one from Audrey. Do you have another one for us? Yes, uh, this question is from Latif. What is the one error that you keep seeing over and over and over again? I. I can take that one. I don't know if there's one error that I keep seeing over and over again, because every story I've touched so far is like very different. But like some of the most common errors, I would say, at least in audio, could be like dates uh, that are often mis, 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 like remembered or uh, written. Um, I would say dates is probably the most relevant one. Um, And just like, I don't know. It's such, a, it's such a tricky question because, like I said, everything is different. Um, we weren't, but I would say, like, absolutely dates. And I, and one thing that's different about audio is that oftentimes, coming from like a print magazine background, I look for the spelling of names, but in audio, it, it matters a lot less as long as the pronunciation is correct, which is kind of funny. <laughs> oh yeah, you're kind of off the proper noun hook a little. A little bit. A little, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Till everything goes into a transcript and. No, not anymore. Uh, what about you, Christopher? Uh, I, there's, I, I, it's usually like small stuff that are like the, it's like titles. Um, you get like Natalie said, dates, titles, um, just like little basic things that get kind of like, that's, I mean, that's, I, those are like the most common. There's nothing big that I can think of that's every time or whatever it's it's just a small little like fact checking 101 that kind of gets overlooked uh i'm going to jump in because i just happened to see a question from one of my uh, canadian radio colleagues ali graham so i'm going to ask it before i get to your next one syed how do you decide who is an appropriate authority to fact check with for example like talking to police departments or governments that have track records of lying to the public um, and or publications. I think we got into that a little bit um, with sort of managing the Chinese government source that just said this is all lies, even though you had some other evidence. But do either of you want to talk to that? I think the police and sort of official sources question is an interesting one. Like what, how do you evaluate the official sources? I got a pretty fun kind of long story about that. Like, not, I don't know, I won't make, like, take too much time, but 
like yes sometimes people do like the government does sort of mess around with you and just to give you a quick example that like maybe a few years ago on an immigration show we had some tape of Jess Sessions saying that over 50 percent of asylum seekers don't show up in court and I tried like crazy to confirm that with like the Justice Department and some other stuff and they just kind of blew me off and they wouldn't give me any information and so we cut the tape then like three weeks later four weeks later the New York Times reported something was like um only 25% of uh, asylum seekers don't show up. And the like, Sessions was saying, 50. so I was like, what the hell? And I called the Justice Department. I was like, what is going on? And they're like, that's not what they're looking at. Like, that's, they're wrong. Like, they're looking at something. And I don't think the New York Times was wrong. But, like, they, they were just like, that's not what that is. They were like, give me a few days. I'll give you something. So they sent me this page, this thing that was like, 2,000 pages long. And they were like, see on page 1,250. And, like, right there, there was a number that that showed Jeff Sessions was wrong, even with his own like statement, because it was like, as I crunched the numbers, it was like 45%. And then, so I was just like, put that in my brain somewhere. So Jeff Sessions says over 50%. The, the Justice Department source is like 45%. New York Times said like 25%. Flash forward a few years for another story, and a reporter says the vast majority of asylum seekers do show up. And I'm like, okay, great. So I called the people, and their source was this, agency called track which is out of syracuse and these are kind, they're kind of lefty and they were like well we don't trust the government we don't trust like this and and like they don't give you the data and so i had like all that like three or four conflicting sources and then i called somebody at the migration policy institute which is like this big think tank in dc they're basically nonpartisan, and they kind of really broke down to me like why the numbers were the way they were it's like they were like okay so the justice department's numbers are that way because they only look at closed cases but the tracks the track people are only looking at cases that are that are it's the closed cases but also cases that are open and like and so when you like my, i guess my answer is it's not an easy thing to like suss out it's like you you really gotta you really gotta call around because like so like information can be manipulated and it and it does take a little bit of um time to like suss it out that's just like one example that jumped to my brain yeah i mean that's essentially sort of like fact checking the government source on top of you know not just using them as the primary one i think that makes sense uh natalie do you have one that comes to mind or any other thoughts about how to use a sort of a classic official journalistic sources I think Christopher's example was a great one. I love the Migration Policy Institute. Personally, they're wonderful. And I think that that's the right idea is to sort of look for NGOs and other think tanks that can sort of help either support or sort of fact check the government in and of itself. So that's really the what I was going to say. And I think that's a great example to illustrate that. Um, I've, I'm sure that your producers are sort of like used to the like, you know, heavy sigh or intake of breath when you're like, Okay, it's a long story. I can only imagine, Christopher, are you trying to explain? Like, here's why we have to change the number. It's going to take me a minute. Um, I'm sure they're, they're used to it now. Okay, uh, Syed, do you have another question for us? Yeah, so this one is from Dylan Hoover. The question is, when you call someone to fact check their narrative or interview, how do you frame that conversation? In other words, do you prepare questions to confirm to the answers or do you ask them to retell a story? Great question. Who, uh, Natalie, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Um, I can talk about this from a magazine perspective since I haven't like, called anybody for audio yet. Um, but basically, I will look at the scripts or the interview that they've given and their quotes, and I just sort of ask them, you know, like, how old, things like, how old are you? Um, and one thing that's sort of funky, at least in print, is uh, describing writers like, physical descriptions of care of like the sources in the piece and then also when it comes you just sort of have to sort of brace and give the the interviewee uh just like some context to sort of help them understand like how their quotes are being used um but i don't typically come up with a list of questions unless um i have like a governmental source when i and, they, and sometimes they want things in writing which we, we, i don't prefer to do because they can sort of take that and I don't know. It's just a level of trust that I don't typically have all the time um, with the government sources, um, especially in the last in our last administration. Um, but I have this I have the story in front of me uh, from an author, and then I'll just sort of go through the script and sort of paraphrase things. 
um, and sort of listen out for anything that, obviously listening for things that are like easy confirms, yes, 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 I said that, yes, this is true. Um, and I also keep an eye out for if, you know, sources all of a sudden are switching up their story. And then that, then I will pry, I will pry and ask more questions. And I always ask for more detail than what's on the page because I like to understand the entire context of what is, has been written or what's in the script so far. And sometimes that additional information, um, at least on the print side, will sort of help build up a narrative and add some really interesting color to the story that wasn't there before. So that's my strategy. Um, I'm interested to know how either of you manage if and when, I would say when, you're fact checking, maybe it's even an audio piece and you have the original interview, but in the process of checking, the person sort of gets cold feet a bit or starts realizing that maybe they're not sure anymore or this might not be in the context that they wanted it to be in and they almost start trying to like retreat from the consent that they may have given the reporter in the beginning. Maybe you're amazing and that's never happened to you, but if it ever has, I'd be interested to know how you start to manage that even on the phone with someone who starts to be sort of getting nervous or contradicting things that actually they're on tape saying. Uh, that's a tricky thing about it. I'll just say like with like, you know, the vast majority of like what This American Life, like people aren't like contesting that sort of stuff, but the, this, the people who do contest will be like people who are political, or they do, or they they're saying controversial things, and it's it's like I mean I even remember like, or they or they or they start to try to inject like bad information about other people into the stories. It can be a real sort of like, like you, if you have to be like no, but you said this on tape and like you said this like and now you're saying you didn't say it. We have you on. And you have these conversations, and then you and then you have the conversation with the person, and like maybe it didn't go well, like whatever. And then you have a conversation with the producer about it. And, and then you kind of suss out like, wait, what seems like the most responsible thing to do? And like, you know, because like a lot of the times too, it's like, you know, if there's somebody getting cold feet about something that's very traumatic that happened to them, like that's going to be, that's a very different conversation than a conversation with, you know, a politician who says like, I never, I never said that like an Alex Jones type or whatever. It'd be like, that's all lies. That's manipulated or tape or whatever. So like they're all they're all conversations and they're not there's no hard and fast like tsh, tsh. it's a it's a conversation with the producer and the reporter and me being like oh this is what we know and this is what we're most comfortable with yeah and i guess there's someone who is asking um isabel robertson about sort of checking or properly representing emotional truths it's isabel who fact checks for story core and is often working very personal stories and I wonder if you can speak to that, because obviously, as you said, it's very different, like an accountability type interview with a public figure or someone controversial versus like two siblings that misremember or remember an instance in their childhood differently or someone who, you know, believes that something happened a certain way and, and that's their personal recollection and versus someone else's recollection or maybe as Isabel brought up sort of this idea of what's emotionally true to them. I'd really like to hear how you manage these stories that maybe aren't big picture policy legal, you know, heavy, but are really heavy for the people involved. I mean, I usually call them and I give them the context, like this is, you know, I give them the overview of like what the story is about and like, you know, so-and-so talked to you about this, this, and this, this is what the, the story is about. And I kind of like lay out like, and then they had, and then you said this and you said this and, you know, I have a conversation with them about like what happened. Um, and I just can't think of like, a, I, I mean, I can't think of like an instance where somebody has gotten like super cold feet about like about this sort of stuff. Like a lot of times they sort of know they're telling an emotional story to like this American life. And they kind of like know what that, know what that is. Like I haven't had a lot of experience with somebody being like, getting cold feet like more often than not they're 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 thankful for the call and appreciate it i um i haven't had tons of experience where somebody was like freaked out or something have either of you ever had a sort of inconsequential but highly variable like recollection from two different people in the story or has it generally already been sorted out by the reporter I, I don't know. I don't know what this one, this one might be, I don't, I don't know. I don't, this is, I don't know. Do you have one, Natalie? Yeah. So I think so. I mean, I think 
I know this is an audio conversation, but from a print standpoint, That's I fine. mean, we would want to like have both voices and like at least acknowledge the fact that there was like a conflict of 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 memory or of perception or of emotion. You know, oftentimes we're talking about family, like uh you know if, if a child you know this is a general example like says that they had a horrible childhood and then it's our job to sort of call like the parent to verify like would you agree and oftentimes a parent will hardly admit that they like subjected their child to a very just like uncomfortable and like dysfunctional childhood but i think it's worth at least you know giving that other party you know at least at least, at least giving, letting their voices be heard to be able to tell the entire story in a full circle way. And then the listener or reader can sort of draw inferences from there and sort of, and I think it's just, it's our job as fact checkers, as journalists to tell both sides of the story, even though one emotional truth seems very compelling. Uh, sometimes, you know, we just have to, have to sort of give air to the other side of the story even if it sounds crazy or if we really want to believe the person it's just part of our job to sort of de dedicate some time for doing that i hope that answers your question i think that's that's a yeah that makes a lot of sense and i think it's a good point that it goes back to that idea too of sometimes fact checkers aren't just crossing things out but sometimes suggesting add additions or things that might be missing for context or for yeah, bringing in another voice that wasn't originally there. Um, anything to add to that, Christopher? Um, no, I think her thoughts are good. Like, I mean, I, I can think of instances on the show where we've had like a, a person do like an emotional story, like, you know, like, and then you contact the family or the, the parents or whatever, and they kind of be like, no, that's not true. And we have to like, kind of like work in some, some things about that. Um, but yeah, like I do, but I don't think any of that, like, yeah, you do. We we do contact like you know, parents or uncles or whatever, and and try to take into like account, you know, their their point of view. Great. Well, thank you both so much for everything that you shared, for getting us right behind the curtain into the you know details of how this all goes down for those who haven't done it. Uh, there are so many questions. People will keep you here for two hours or more. I'm sure if they could, but. We're all super busy back checking the next great podcast to come out, I'm sure. So I want to uh, thank you for being here. Thank you to everyone else who came and who uh, asked questions and who was interested in facts. I'm really happy that there's this much interest and I hope that we keep moving forward with that in audio um, it becomes more and more the norm. So thanks very much. Uh, that's it for today. We'll be emailing a link to those who registered to a recording of this event if you would like to uh, hear it or re-listen to any parts or watch any parts again. Thanks very much. Thank you, Callie. Thanks everybody for watching. Thanks. Thank you. Enjoyed this. <laughs>